Love is forged. It's not found. And that was the first episode of Hearted Dating I ever listened to by my dog, JP, who, by the way, ripped that quote off from someone else. Uh, So just to say, you know, we're all quoting someone here. Okay, I'm at least going to quote him because he's my boy. What's up, fam? It's your boy, JJ. Welcome to the mini Manso Friday. Today, we have a fun one. I know you saw that title and said, what? Hey, I felt the same way when I heard this phrase, but if there's one phrase that has really stuck with me in marriage, especially for the hard moments, the moments of conflict, the moments of maybe looking the other way, I would always say that this probably stuck out to me the most. You always marry the wrong one. You always marry the wrong person. That sounds so funny to say out loud, but I'm telling you guys, once you hear me out, you'll see exactly what I mean. Before we jump in, you know what I'm loving lately? Two things. Number one, red onions. Yes, I just said that. Red onions. First of all, they're purple. Okay, they're not red like at all. So I don't even know why they're called red onions, but we've been making this Jennifer Aniston uh, salad. Just Google it. It's uh, what is it? It's like quinoa, it's cucumber, it's tomatoes, uh, and it's red onion. And then I throw in uh, chickpeas or another funny name, garbanzo beans, uh, which are loaded with protein. And then I'll cook up chicken on Sundays and toss it in and use that throughout the week. But the red onions, I don't know what happened. Maybe it's because I'm just super mature and grown. I'm a, I'm a, a grown man now, but red onions are like sweet to the taste. And all of a sudden I'm loving them. Like they are like the highlight of my meal is getting the red onion. Uh, number two, Hey, I want to see how this goes. I want to do more hybrid training. Hybrid training is basically, instead of saying I'm a bodybuilder or I'm like a competitive weightlifter, which are like two individual sports, or I'm an endurance athlete, like I like to run, hybrid training basically says I want to be good at all three of those things. I want to add mass, I want to get really strong, and I want to get good at running, get good at running. I'm not even sure if that came out right. I want to be a good runner, okay? And you combine them all. So you have at least three days a week that you're working out, and then like a typical program, you're doing a Monday, Wednesday, Friday weight training split, and then uh, maybe a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday running split. Um, I I am always hesitant to find guys online uh, that I want to like train like and be like, but the two guys I love is Paul Sklar. He is like this 50 year old, absolutely all natural Jack dad. So I do his workouts. Those are like anywhere from like an hour to, to two hours of just like, it's literally you do no cardio, but you do so much volume. That is like the cardio of the workout. So I do those. And then another guy I'm following, and I know he's so popular, is Nick Bear. I know him and the whole BPN team. They're always killing it. I see their content everywhere. I love it. I think something in me, when something is super popular and everyone's doing it, I'm at least I'm just like, I don't want to do it now. If everyone's rocking a Tesla, no, I definitely don't want a Tesla now. If everyone's rocking this shoe brand or this, you know, clothing brand, I'm like, I something in me just I don't want to say it's like the need to be unique. I just don't really like going with the flow always. And maybe like, for example, growing up in the South, you know, I try to 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 make sure I'm not doing this judgmentally, but uh, I always notice like the, all the guys are all wearing Sperry's or they're all wearing new balances and like really short khaki shorts. I'm like, I just don't want to dress like every single person around me. Like I want to be unique and dress how I want to dress. But that being said, I'm following the trend right now, which is hybrid training. I know a lot of guys doing this and I'm excited to try it for myself. (laughs) Lastly, before we jump into the episode in my DMs, I love this one. By the way, I have guys DMing me now and uh, it's so much more helpful when you guys do a voice memo and you send it and I'll be honest, you know, because I keep it real with you guys. If you send it to 
three minute voice memo, I listen to them, but I'll listen on like two X speed. And that really is like saved my life. So please send a voice memo. It's much easier for me and it's much easier for you. And yes, I do fast forward them. This one though, I thought was so funny. Um, this guy says, Hey JJ need some help. I was set up by my doctor, which that was just hilarious, by the way. Set up by my doctor. Uh, we went on our first date. It went really well. I stopped by her office. I dropped off a, a surprise, like a, a little something, something that she really liked and enjoyed and she mentioned on the, on the date. And I just thought it'd be fun to do it. Uh, and then we uh, had a second date lined up. Right before the second date, she said, I need to reschedule because of something with my dad. Is that okay? He said, of course, obviously that's fine with me. He followed up a couple days later and said, Hey, how's your dad doing? And, uh, is everything okay? And she just laughed and said like, ha ha. And then he was like, okay, that's really weird. And then she just didn't reply. And he was like, <laughs> that was last week. What do I do? Like, and now he's like second guessing himself. Like, did I come on too strong? Should I not have dropped off a gift at all? Like, what should I do? And so number one, I just said, listen, you know, <laughs> dropping off like a five or $10 tree at her office after a first date, I think is okay. People like Kate or Rachel, Cheryl, you know, everyone has a slightly different opinion here. I think it all comes down to intention. And if you're just a giving person and you think it's like fun to give a thoughtful surprise and you can do it with no strings attached, like you're not trying to manipulate yourself into being liked by this person, you just genuinely want to delight them and surprise them. And it can just simply be that I am all for it. That's kind of how I'm wired. So I'm a little biased towards that. Um, some people are cautious against it because if we're being honest, we're trying to, you know, bend them, manipulate them, kind of like, you know, gift them a present into liking us. I've felt that way before sometimes. So I have to be really cautious when I'm doing this with people or new friends and stuff. I just, I never want to inauthentically give something to somebody. Like if I give it, I want to give it genuinely with not a single string attached. If they didn't say thank you, if it didn't make their day, anything like that at all, like I have nothing in this fight. I got no dog in this fight. I just genuinely want to gift it. So I would say that number one. And number two, when it comes to asking her like what's going on, listen, I, I think in a lot of ways we are way too apprehensive and scared to kind of be honest in these situations. If it's been a week and you want to go back and visit with all the grace and love and kindness in the world saying, Hey, by the way, this is how I feel when you left me on red. Um, I just want to check and see like if you are okay, your dad's okay. Um, if you're not interested in dating me and going on a second date, I just want to let you know, it's totally okay to communicate that. Like you create like a really safe space for them to communicate back. It's personally, I would say resolve all the feelings and frustration and pain before you go have a conversation. Like I personally don't recommend going into situations and conflicts, especially with someone you barely know and saying, I really need you to apologize, right? I'm coming to you with these big feelings and I need you to apologize for me being okay. I mean, that's like kind of <laughs> codependency at its finest. You know, you're wrapping other people up into your problems and your issues and your challenges, even if they might've caused it. To be honest, I would go into that situation uh, willing to forgive and just say, it's totally okay if you're not interested. And honestly, if you still wanted to go out on a second date, I would be like, I would be still interested and I'm totally okay owning that, presenting that, but you just let me know what you'd like to do. We don't have to do it or we can go either way. I'm good. And I love just removing all the pressure from them having to apologize, them having to say yes, them having to say no. You just can simply present options for them to move forward and you're good either way. Okay. That's my thoughts and feedback. Now for today's episode, I, man, I remember first hearing this from the goat himself. We all know him. We all love him. We'll all see him one day in heaven and dab him up and say, Tim Keller, thank you so much, bro. Oh, I just, the greatest teacher ever. But fun fact, when you hear this quote saying, you always marry the wrong one, it wasn't from Tim Keller, right? 
It was actually from an ethics professor at Duke University, Stanley Hauerwas. He happens to be a Christian and he is phenomenal as far as a teacher. I was researching this episode, uh, especially because we're in a season of hot takes and uh, controversial truths, and I could not think of a better one than this. You always marry the wrong one. Imagine hearing that on your wedding day from your pastor as he's giving you the vows and you're looking into the eyes of your loved one. And he says, by the way, you're marrying the wrong person person today. And he says that because of this, and this is from Stanley Hauerwas. He goes, destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes marriage and the family are primarily institutions of personal fulfillment. These things are necessary functions for us to become whole and happy. And the assumption here is that someone just right for us to marry is there and exists. And if we look closely enough and we search hard enough, we will find the right person. This assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. What? And then he goes, we never know who we marry. We just think we do. And even if we at first marry the right person, the right kind of person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing it is, means we are not the same person after we have entered it. The primary challenge of marriage is learning how to love and care for the stranger you find yourself married to. I love it. Tim Keller once said, I've been married to five women and all of their names are Kathy, (laughs) meaning his wife has changed five, six, seven times. I've been married for almost two years now, and I can absolutely say that's true. Why? Because life and seasons are so catastrophically different. I mean, it just, it is amazing to see your spouse hopefully grow in front of your eyes, but your spouse absolutely changes and grows right before your very eyes. And because as a single, I think this was crazy to me at first. Um, You know, like as I grew up, especially in an evangelical Christian household, you know, this sounded so wrong. Like there can't be a wrong one. I've waited. I've held my purity in check. I've waited to have sex for that right one who loves Jesus, who God created me to marry, you know, this partner, this kingdom partner that God has ordained. I want a God ordained marriage between me and the special person who God has set out and withheld for me. Like Jacob sent out, Uh, servants to go find his wife, to go find a righteous, godly wife. Right. And so we had, I I remember hearing this. I'm like, is there really not a right one? Is there really not a right person? Like saying that just feels so strange to me. Or when I asked that, then I'm like, well, what's the difference between the right one or the one, right? Like the right one versus the one. I'm like, it's kind of the same thing if you think about it. And so with right, I think there's the right kind of person to meet, but the right one specific individual, I'm not so sure about because here's what we believe about love and marriage at this point in heart of dating and how we stand. Love is forged. It's not found. And that was the first episode of Heart of Dating I ever listened to by my dog, JP, who, by the way, ripped that quote off from someone else. Uh, so just to say, you know, we're all quoting someone here. Okay. I'm at least going to quote him because he's my boy. Um, but what does that mean? Love is forged, not found. It means that love is not stumbled upon. It means it doesn't just happen. Like the spark, that fire, the you know, they're marked by God. It doesn't work like that. I really think when we talk about the spark, it is just an influx of emotions on your end that doesn't really have to do anything with the other person, but everything to do with you, uh, a fantasy in your mind, an idea that exists about the person that you've dreamed up that will fulfill you. That's really what I think the spark is. It is everything to do with you and your romantic idea of what your person and love will look like. And the second someone fits that description, you project an entire narrative about them and their life to fit your puzzle and fit your story and and fit your life. And all of a sudden 
you found your spark. There's no soulmate waiting for you to discover them. You know, it, and, and that's what love is forged, not found means. It means that the one doesn't exist. The right one does not exist. The only one that exists is the one that you choose over and over again. What do you mean by that? You choose over and over again. Well, let me tell you something. Obviously, some of the people here have been married. Some people here have been in serious relationships. There are going to become moments after moments after moments where you have to look in the mirror and say, I really don't feel like I'm in love today. In fact, I really feel the opposite. I feel resentment bo boiling up. I feel anger boiling up. I, I have to choose in this moment myself or this person. I have to choose to self-protect and take care of numero uno today, or I have to look in the mirror and say, today I'm choosing this other person. You see, Ruth Bell said it like this, Marriage is simply a union between two good forgivers. Marriage is simply a union between two forgivers. I've also heard it said like this. The greatest gift you can give your spouse is the gift of self-denial. I love that because that's, that's really what it means. It means there is no right one. There is no one. There's a right kind of person. But at the end of the day, even when it gets tough, when it gets rough, when there's challenges, you are looking and saying, I choose you over me, which means I'm going to absorb this offense. I'm going to absorb this pain. You know, I love the idea of forgiveness because we oftentimes forget like a debt has to be absorbed. If I owe you a million dollars and you forgive me of that million dollars, you are absorbing that loss. Like the million dollar debt doesn't just disappear. That's exactly what happened when our just God absorbed the, the pain and the punishment of our sin, it, it didn't just magically disappear. Jesus absorbed it. So whenever you are offended, whenever you are really trying to work through forgiving someone, I think we forget at the end of the day, like we are absorbing that pain. We are collecting that offense and saying, I, I am willing to take this on instead of you. However, the good news for us is that we don't just get to carry around the backpack of pain, of resentment, of hatred, of betrayal, of hurt. We actually get to take that to the foot of Jesus and say, this is too great for me to carry. I totally confess that I am hurt, that I am pissed off, that I'm really, really, really offended right now. Would you help me? Would you take this burden with me? And that is the joy of being a Christian is we actually have a place to take offense which is amazing. You know, so that is, that is the idea of the one and choosing the one over and over and over again within terms of marriage. The other problem I have with the marrying the right one is this, because this is a story that as much as we want to pretend doesn't exist happens every single day. And it happens with your neighbor who's not a Christian. And it happens with your coworker who is a Christian. It happens with your cousin who's not a Christian. And it happens with even your pastor who's leading a congregation. Here's what happens. And it's one of the saddest stories to always exist throughout mankind is this. What happens 15 years later when you guys have had three kids together and let's talk about from a man's perspective. You've had three kids. All of a sudden, she doesn't look the same way she used to. And more importantly, her spark and her joy that so much attracted you, her, her vivid love for life is kind of gone. And now on top of that, she's just nagging you like incessantly and she's deeply unhappy. And all of a sudden you're pretty unhappy too, because the person you married 15 years ago is not the person you're looking at today. And then you're at work, then you're at the gym and you're at church and without even noticing it, what happens when you meet that one woman who, well, maybe that was the right one that you should have married after all this time, right? Like just, you know, you don't get it. Th this woman I met is actually fun. She actually gets it. She's actually spontaneous and, and she cares about her body. She's, she's really, really fit, you know, and that, that spark of life, that joy that I was so attracted to that doesn't exist in my spouse anymore. Well, sh she has that and she actually has it more than my wife ever had it, you know, and, and we get along really, really well. Like we're actually compatible. And when I think about it, me and my wife, 
we were, we were never really that compatible. You know, we were just kind of young and dumb. And, uh, and, and maybe, uh, when you married her, you knew after you married her that she might've been the wrong one. Like as you guys started doing conflict, you started really looking at your, your marriage and relationship. You weren't that compatible in the first place. And, and they really didn't love God the way that you thought they did. You, you know, what if, what if you married the wrong one? And this is, this is the one you should have married all along. Like you made a mistake. She, and, and you guys don't get it. You know, the, the right one, the one I just met, she is so much more emotionally safe. Like she actually cares about my feelings and, and she just gets it. And I, I just really regret, you know, who I married because th- maybe she was the wrong one. See, that's the idea of the right one. Anytime we invoke the right one, well, guess what? That also means the idea of the wrong one exists. And as long as that exists, we'll always be open up to other options, right? Because it's the same thing. When, when you invoke saying, God said, I have to do this. Well, you're invoking that there's no other way that you are not absolutely or could be wrong. And so when we speak in the absolute with the right one and, and, and the one, it also means that there's 3.3 other billion wrong ones that I chose not to marry. And I found the right one. And I, and I, and the idea of the right one for me, it never lasts uh, in the sense of you're always going to be faced with a decision. Was well, this really the right one or not? And maybe, you know, in some ways people can twist that and turn it and say, you know, because it's the right one, it helps me choose her over and over and over again. Well, I would just say, if she's the right one, why are you having to re-choose her <laughs> weekly or monthly, right? Like you would think with the right one, it would it would fit like a glove. It would be easy and you would never have to re-decide, is this the right one? If you were so infatuated and sure on your, in your soul and heart of hearts that this is the right one, right? Like it, it wouldn't make sense. Um, so like if you, if you find your dream house and you're saying, this is the the right house for me for the next 50 years, it wouldn't make sense that two years later when the HVAC system is out, you're having to convince yourself outside as you're sweating and fixing it or, or mowing the, the lawn that takes you 12 hours in the hot sun. you you wouldn't have to remind yourself, this is the right one. This was the house. This is the one, this is the one and choose it and choose it after frustration. You, you would be so infatuated that and happy for the rest of your life in those next 50 years that you got the right one, the, the one to fulfill your dreams, right? You wouldn't have to remind yourself and rechoose and rechoose. So that's what I would just say about the right one. And, and I would actually totally agree. I think in a lot of ways, you always marry the wrong one because there is no right one, right? There is no right one. There is no the one. And historically, you know, just to kind of show you guys where we're at is this idea of uh, marrying out of compatibility, like it never existed. It never existed until the past hundred years. And I thought there was a, a, a fun fact you know, that people kind of bring up more and more these days because they joke around and say, let's go back to arranged marriages. Well, (laughs) it is kind of funny to look at the divorce rates. So check this out. Apparently arranged marriages have a divorce rate of 4%, but marriages where you get to choose out of your own free will, anybody in the whole wide world have a divorce rate on average in the U S of 50%. Isn't that crazy? Like, it is basically saying you have to eat this hot dog and enjoy it. And 90%, 96% of people say that was an amazing hot dog and 4% don't. And then the other people get a worldwide buffet of anything they want. And 50% walk away from the buffet saying, I didn't really like that. Now that's probably one of the worst analogies I've ever had in the history of hard dating, but you guys get what I mean. It's kind of like ironic that with all the choice and autonomy in the world, people are more happy unhappy in the decisions to marry than ever before. Now, I would also add a ton of context. If you're living in a place that still does arrange marriages, now not all arranged marriages look the same in the world. Like for example, in India, there's uh, teenage girls under the age of 18 who are taken out of school and forced to marry. Okay. First of all, that's not kosher. And second of all, like even if that poor girl wanted to divorce, she can never leave. Now there's other places in the world where there's arranged marriages and there's a little bit more input. They have a little bit more weight in the decision and the parents will allow them to marry maybe a set of options of people that they've pre-approved. Not the worst system in the world. Again, it's still a little strange, but I've always found it that interesting that, you know, (laughs) 
even though they obviously don't have the same autonomy to walk away, you would probably have to ask this. Do you arrange marriages if given the same opportunity to walk away from marriages as, you know, the couples and the weddings and the marriages in the United States, would it be the same? And my guess is probably not. Uh, but you know, I don't think we'll ever know, but the idea of like where we're at and people like to break this down and say, you know, really what we're at is we're more picky than ever before. And I would, I would probably say that's true to degree. Um, if you've ever watched Seinfeld, there's a great like comical lens of, you know, what this means to be like so picky. Uh, Jerry is, uh, he's like always breaking up with women because they have certain quirks, you know, and some of them are more egregious than others. Uh, the one I always think about is in one episode, <laughs> she's like a beautiful blonde and I don't, I don't think he notices everything about her. So they're out on the date. And, uh, <laughs> he notices that she has like main hands. <laughs> and so when they, when they cut, to her face, you can't see her hands. And then they do like hand shots only of her like ripping the bread and they <laughs> they put a man in her same outfit, but you can only see these <laughs> clearly like man hands. And so they're supposed to be her hands. And so she's like ripping the bread and he's like noticing like her big, <laughs> her big hands. And then uh, he's like uh, trying to get over it. And then she, uh, Jerry gets a beer and he takes, she takes the beer and, and twists off the cap. And <laughs> as he's grabbing the beer, he's like, that's not a twist off. <laughs> and, uh, then she, <laughs> she gets lobster claws and she, <laughs> she's like breaking the lobster with her like bare hands. And so obviously he breaks up with her and he's obsessed because she's really cool. She's really beautiful, but she's got these main hands. And so he's complaining to them. And, uh, yeah, I just, I, f I feel like that's the same sentiment I found in myself. I found it with my friends. I found it in, in, in church communities. And again, it's not everyone, but I, I would say as a generalization for the culture and where we're at, you know, we have gotten so picky in the sense of if I'm on a dating app, I can absolutely see the sentiment and register when I was looking. And, and what I was talking about last week's episode with Kate is I clearly remember one example of a girl on a dating app she was in Seattle and she was by all means really beautiful, really, really awesome. She was everything I was quote looking for on paper. And I just remember a, such a clear moment and looking back, I'm, I'm so embarrassed, but like her smile just was a little off. And I just remember instead of seeing the beauty and the quirk in it, or, you know, just like talking myself off a ledge, I, I stopped talking to her because of that one stupid little thing in my mind. And I'm like, that's, that's, that is not okay. Like I'm tattling on myself because I hope that challenges you guys, because here's what I would close on. We are looking for someone who will accept me as I am. She's going to compliment my abilities. They're going to compliment and totally accept every passion and hobby I have and cheer me on. They're also going to fulfill every sexual and emotional desire I have. They're going to have the, the body I hope and desire. Uh, they're going to be emotionally, you know, so wonderful for me and nurturing. Um, this is going to require a woman who is a novelist, uh, an astronaut with a background in fashion modeling and personal training. And she also has the low maintenance chillness of a dude. And she has the conflict skills of a therapist. And yeah, that's what I like. Do you listen? Do you hear the absolute unicorn of what I'm looking for and how specific it is? And that is how I thought about it. Like in, in some ways I was like, God, whoever you have for me, I'm totally kosher with. That sounds good to me. But in my heart of hearts, if I was being honest, that was really kind of what I was looking for and holding out for. Like I overlooked so many wonderful options because that's what I was holding out for. And we do the same thing. Women do the same thing in the man. They want the six foot, six figure six pack, um, 60 year old maturity of a magical fantasy man who doesn't exist. Right. You know, it's just like, we do the same thing on both sides, but that's not, a, first of all, those people don't exist. Like they do not exist. Okay. And the more we fantasize about them, the more you're just going to be supremely disappointed with your current dating options and your future spouse. But more importantly, I mean, that's just like, that is a marriage based not on self-denial, but on self-fulfillment. Let me say that again. 
a, a marriage based on fantasy and what you love and desire is a is inherently a marriage that's based off self fulfillment, not self denial, and it requires a low or no maintenance partner who meets all of your needs while making almost no claims on you. Simply put, I think that people are 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 and myself was included asking and looking for far too much in a marriage partner. And we've been duped into believing this lie that love and its most pure form should not be hard. It should come naturally. Man, what a sad lie that we've come to believe. I mean, not only is it the most demeaning thing about love, which the greatest love story of all is, is, what we know in the Bible and the letters and the love letters of what Christ has done for us. Does that sound natural? Does does the love that Christ endured and sacrificed and gave us, does that sound easy and fun and flowing? Does it sound like it came just naturally like a spark? It was paid for. It was, it was the ultimate gift of self denial to the point of yes, death, that does not sound very natural to me. And then we go into marriage expecting it for it to be some natural, easy, fun, comfortable thing, like two becoming one with all the background and trauma and, and challenges and the way we apologize and do conflict is easy. Does that sound easy? But let me say this, let me close on a word of hope. The, the reason why marriage is so painful and yet wonderful is because it is a reflection of not natural love, not easy, fun, romantic love. It, it's wonderful because it is a reflection of the gospel. When people read Ephesians 5, they forget Ephesians 1 through 4, which is the story of a painful and wonderful man who paid everything for you and I. That's why the marriage is so beautiful because it reflects that gospel marriage of Christ and what he did for his bride. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed and are in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. And at the very same time, you and me, are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That is the only kind of relationship that will really transform us. And a marriage that replicates that process is the only one that will really truly satisfy us because that is a gospel marriage. Now I'm going to close this out on one thing. It's time for me to run to my wife right now and apologize for the punk I've been being today, because that is exactly what I mean about being genuine and authentic. I, I, I read, I prep for this episode. I speak it out to you guys in, in the greatest winner, the greatest benefactor of reading everything I just reminded you of is me. And that's exactly what I needed to hear today as someone who is deeply flawed and deeply sinful and deeply selfish. I needed to hear that message. So I hope it encourages you, whether you get to use that message for yourself today, or you get to put it in your back pocket for one day down the road. I hope it encourages you. I hope it edifies you. God bless you guys and have a wonderful day. Let's go.